subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everybody, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we shall be analyzing the Hindu newspaper dated 3rd of June 2022 of the New Delhi edition. Let us begin our today's discussion. Now the first article appears on page number 9. The article is titled as Drilling Down. This article shall be important mainly with respect to GS Paper 3 Indian Economy. Before discussing this article, let us first look into its background. See, when you look at India's crude oil dependence, India is presently the third largest consumer of crude oil after US and China. More than 85% of our crude oil requirements are basically met through our imports. And as far as the year 21-22 is concerned, the total import bill for the crude oil was as high as around 104 billion dollars. Obviously, there are a number of reasons as to why we import more crude oil from other countries. One obvious reason is we do not have adequate reserves of crude oil. That is why we are required to import the crude oil from other countries. Now, the other problem here is whatever limited reserves of crude oil that we have, even these limited reserves, we are not being able to exploit them optimally. This is evident in the fact that the crude oil production in the year 21-22 has dropped to its lowest level in the last two decades. And this is because we are more dependent upon the aging or old wells for the extraction of crude oil. So in a way, we are not being able to attract more private sector investment in the exploration of new petroleum or the crude oil wells. And we are dependent more on the old wells for the extraction of crude oil and that is why there has been decline in the crude oil production to its lowest level in the last two decades. So when we import more crude oil from other countries, this is considered to be a setback for the Atmanirbhar Bharat. This is so because when we import more crude oil, our imports would be much higher than our exports. So this would lead to higher amount of trade deficit. Similarly, whenever the international crude oil prices increase, as it is happening right now, there would be large-scale rupee depreciation vis-a-vis -vis dollars. For example, you must have read in the newspapers that the rupee value has depreciated to an all-time low of 77 vis-a-vis -vis dollars. And one of the reasons is because of the increasing crude oil prices. Further, crude oil is also considered to be a major input for the Indian economy since it is used for a number of purposes including the transportation as well as energy. So as we import crude oil at higher prices, this will obviously lead to the imported inflation within the Indian economy. So on account of higher trade deficit or the current account deficit or higher value of rupee depreciation or higher rate of inflation. Indian economy would face the macroeconomic instability. That is why there is a need to reduce the import of crude oil into the Indian economy and ensure the energy security. So as far as the UPC examination is concerned, from the perspective of the prelims examination, one should be aware about various aspects related to crude oil such as the country's ranking in terms of crude oil reserves, production and imports at the global level. And as far as India is concerned, you must understand the trends in the domestic production of crude oil, trends in terms of imports, trends in terms of export of petroleum products and so on. And as far as the mains examination is concerned, here one should be aware as to what all strategies should we adopt in order to ensure the energy security. So based upon our discussion, a main question for your practice here could be the higher import of crude oil into India poses challenges for the energy security. In the light of this statement, discuss various strategies to ensure Atmanirbhar Bharat in the energy sector. So keeping in mind the requirement of the UPC prelims and mains examination, let us discuss all the aspects related to ensuring the energy security in India. 
starting with the important prelims pointers when it comes to the crude oil production as well as exports. See, if you look at the countries which have highest crude oil reserves, these countries are Venezuela followed by Saudi Arabia and Iran. So these three countries have the world's highest crude oil reserves. And when it comes to the top producers of crude oil, the top producers are USA followed by Saudi Arabia and Russia. So last year, USA had overtaken Saudi Arabia to become the largest producer of crude oil. So right now it is USA followed by Saudi Arabia. When it comes to the top consumers of crude oil, first is US, second is China and at third place we have India. So India is the third largest consumer of crude oil. And when you look at the top exporters of crude oil, here the top exporters are Saudi Arabia, Russia and Iraq. As you can see, Russia is the second largest exporter of crude oil. So because of the Russia-Ukraine war, as well as on account of Western sanctions on Russia, Russia has been finding it difficult to export crude oil to other countries. This has led to a supply side shock and hence the crude oil prices in the global market have been increasing. When it comes to the domestic level, that is as far as India is concerned with respect to crude oil, India, as I said earlier, it is the third largest importer as well as consumer of crude oil. The top suppliers of crude oil to India in the year 2019-20 was Iraq followed by USA and Saudi Arabia. See, what India basically does is, India imports the crude oil from other countries such as say Iraq, USA, Saudi Arabia and so on. And this crude oil that we import, this is in turn processed into various petroleum products which include petrol, diesel, aviation turbine fuel, kerosene, lubricants and so on. And these petroleum products are in turn exported by India to other countries. So when you look at the export of petroleum products by India, presently the petroleum products account for the second largest share in our export basket after the engineering goods. So if you arrange the different commodity groups in terms of their share in our exports, the engineering goods account for the highest share and at the second place we have the petroleum products. So please remember these things as far as the prelims examination is concerned. Now coming to various strategies to ensure the energy security in India. Now if you have a look at the mains practice question, here the question is that the higher import of crude oil into India poses challenges for the energy security and accordingly you are required to discuss various strategies to ensure the Atma Nirbhar Bharat in the energy sector. So in order to write an answer to this particular practice question, in your introduction, you could highlight about India's crude oil dependence and its implications on the Indian economy. And when it comes to the body of the answer, in the body of the answer, you must discuss various strategies to ensure the Atmanirbha Bharat in the energy sector. And ideally, these strategies you should be able to discuss in the form of bullet points. So you must have at least around six to seven bullet points in order to write about how to ensure the energy security. So as far as these points are concerned, first and foremost, you could write about the need to build sufficient amount of buffer of crude oil in order to check large scale volatility in the international crude oil prices. In order to build sufficient buffer of crude oil, the government of India has launched the strategic petroleum reserves. So when you look at the strategic petroleum reserves, here the crude oil is actually stored in the underground caves which are located along the eastern and western coast of India. The strategic petroleum reserves are managed by a separate entity known as the Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserves Limited which functions under the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Right now, we have the strategic petroleum reserves located at three important places which include Vishakapatnam along the eastern coast and along the western coast we have Mangalore and Padur. 
Further, in the year 2019, the Union Cabinet has also given an approval for the construction of a strategic petroleum reserve at Chandikol, which is located in the state of Odisha. So right now, the strategic petroleum reserves that we hold is sufficient for us to meet our crude oil requirements for 9.5 days. So going forward, we need to increase our overall reserves in order to check the last scale volatility in the international crude oil prices. And in order to do that, we must be able to increase the private sector investment in the strategic petroleum reserves through the public-private partnership mode. Secondly, we need to give a push to the renewable energy sector that is solar energy, wind energy, hydropower energy and so on. So presently, if you look at the total installed power capacity in India, it is around 3.9 lakh megawatt. So this is the total installed electricity generation in India. Out of which, as you can see, the thermal power alone accounts for the land share that is 60% share in the total installed capacity and it is followed by the renewable energy which includes solar, wind, biopower, small hydropower and waste to energy and then we have the large hydropower which accounts for 12% and the nuclear energy which accounts for the 2% share. So presently if you look at our achievements in the renewable energy sector, India presently stands at fourth place globally in terms of the total installed power capacity for the renewable energy sector. It is ranked fourth place in terms of wind energy and fifth in terms of solar energy. And the total installed capacity of the renewable energy including the large hydropower projects. So large hydropower projects are basically those hydropower projects whose installed capacity is more than 25 megawatt. So if we include the renewable energy and the large hydropower projects, the total installed power capacity of the renewable energy is 38%. And if you look at the total installed capacity of the non-fossil energy sources, so non-fossil energy sources will include the renewable energy that is both this part as well as the large hydropower project as well as the nuclear energy. So as you can see here, the total installed capacity of the non-fossil fuels is 26 plus 12 plus 2, that is 40 percent. As some of you must be knowing that as per our nationally determined contribution, that is under the Paris climate change deal, we have committed to have at least 40 percent of the installed capacity from the non-fossil energy sources by the end of 2030. So already this particular target we have achieved much earlier in the year 2022 itself. So as far as these aspects are concerned, please remember these things. In particular, we can have a look at the contribution of the different renewable energy sources. And as you can clearly see here, the solar power accounts for a much higher share in relation to the wind power. So going forward, in order to reduce our dependence on crude oil, we need to give a further fillip to the renewable energy sector. Next thing, see when it comes to natural gas, natural gas is considered to be much more cleaner, environment friendly and a safer fuel. However, the problem here is presently the share of natural gas in the overall energy mix of India is hardly around 6%. So the government of India has already come up with a vision of promoting natural gas based economy. Idea is to increase the share of natural gas in the energy mix from present 6% to 15% by the end of 2025. So going forward, we need to attract more of investment, particularly in the exploration of the natural gas in the Indian economy. Nextly, so the government of India has started the ethanol blending program. The basic idea behind this particular program is to mix ethanol with petrol. So when we mix ethanol with petrol, it will not only be environment friendly, but it will also help us reduce the import of crude oil within the Indian economy. So the government's target is to achieve 20% ethanol blending, that is E20, by the end of 2025. Earlier, 
the target of e20 or 20% ethanol blending was to be met by the end of 2030 but last year the government has preponed this target by another 5 years so now the target is to be met by 2025 so recently the niti ayog had published a document known as roadmap for the transition of the ethanol blending by 2025 in its document the niti ayog has highlighted that presently we are facing the demand supply mismatch with respect to ethanol and this demand supply mismatch has to be bridged for example the niti ayog has highlighted that in order to achieve e20 by 2025 we need at least 1000 crore liters of ethanol but if you look at the present domestic production of ethanol it is hardly around 700 crore liters so we are facing a demand supply mismatch of almost around 300 crore liters so going forward we need to ramp up the investment in the ethanol production in the indian economy so that we are able to bridge this particular gap between demand and supply and ensure e20 by 2025 nextly some of you must be knowing that the government of india has launched national hydrogen mission so going forward we need to significantly ramp up investment particularly in the research and development in order to ensure the success of the national hydrogen mission nextly see most of the crude oil that we import from other countries it gets processed into petrol and diesel and petrol and diesel is in turn used as a transportation fuel in india so if you have to reduce the import of crude oil we would have to promote electric vehicles so in order to promote electric vehicles already the government of india has launched the fame scheme however in spite of the success of fame scheme the overall penetration of electric vehicles in case of India is hardly around 1.3%. If you look at other countries, in other countries, particularly countries such as Sweden, Iceland, etc., in these countries, the share of electric vehicles is much higher. For example, in Iceland, it is as high as 45%. In Sweden, it is around 32%. Apart from that, China, accounted for around 50% of the global sale of electric vehicles last year. So in comparison to other countries, the overall share of electric vehicles in India is quite lower. So going forward, we need to promote the adoption of electric mobility, particularly by addressing issues related to the lower range of electric vehicles, by setting up of charging infrastructure under the FAME scheme and so on. Apart from that, in the recent Union Budget 22-23, the finance minister has announced the battery swapping policy in order to bring down the initial cost of electric vehicles and promote electric mobility. The launch of this particular policy is a step in the right direction. If you want to know the details about the battery swapping policy, that is what is this particular policy, how it will benefit the electric mobility in India, what challenges it could face, please go to the budget discussion which has been uploaded on the YouTube. So all the aspects related to battery swapping policy, I have already discussed in the budget discussion video. So you can go through that particular video. Next is with respect to increasing the domestic production of crude oil. So as discussed before, the domestic production of crude oil has declined to a two decade low, basically because we are relying more on the aging oil wells. So going forward, we need to encourage more private sector investment for the exploration of crude oil in India. And lastly, in order to efficiently manage the overall demand for energy in India, we need to improve the overall energy efficiency. That is the efficiency with which we use energy that should get increased. So various energy efficiency measures which are right now implemented by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency these measures would have to be implemented the right earnest so that we are able to save energy and as we save more amount of energy automatically the need for us to import the crude oil will reduce and we will be able to ensure the energy security in india so these are some of the important aspects which one should know as far as this particular article is concerned so based upon our discussion please have a look at these four prelims questions for practice and let me know the answer in the comment section given below. With this, let us now take up the next article.
Now this particular article appears on page number 11 on the text and context page. The article is titled as China's growing footprint in the Pacific Islands. This article shall be important from the perspective of GS paper 2 international relations. Before discussing this particular article in detail, let us first look into its background. See if you look at the Pacific Island countries, the Pacific Island countries are a group of 14 countries which are located along the tropical zone in the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Island countries are basically located between Asia, Australia, North America and South America. These 14 Pacific Island countries, depending upon the human geography as well as physical geography, they are basically categorized into three different groupings that is Polynesia, Micronesia and Melanesia. So some of the island countries which are part of the Pacific Island countries include the Caronil Island, Marshall Island, Kiribati, Solomon Island, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Cook Island and so on. So if you look at the overall significance or the importance of these Pacific Island countries, first and foremost, all of these Pacific Island countries have a large area under the exclusive economic zones, which means that these countries possess huge wealth of fisheries, minerals and energy resources. Secondly, the location of these countries is quite strategic. So as stated before, they are strategically located between Asia, Australia and America. And in the past, that is during the Second World War, the Pacific Island countries had emerged as a major theater of conflict, particularly between US and Japan. Thirdly, when it comes to geopolitics, all of these Pacific Island countries, they have common concerns, they have common interest. That is why they form a big voting bloc in the United Nations. And since they form a big voting bloc in the United Nations, major regional powers such as US, China, Australia, etc. always reach out to these Pacific Island countries in order to mobilize their support and form public opinion in their own favor. And last and most importantly, all of these Pacific Island countries share a common concern that is the threat of climate change and the rising sea level. So all of these Pacific Island countries, they are considered to be a major lobby or a major group, which is actually fighting in order to reduce the adverse impact of climate change at a global level. So if you look at the Indo-Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region in the recent times has become a major bone of contention between the regional powers. On one hand, China has sought greater economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region by becoming part of the RCEP, that is, that is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. China is also pushing for the Belt and Road Initiative. China has started claiming that the entire South China Sea belongs to itself. On the other hand, the other regional powers such as Australia, US, etc. They have formed their regional groupings such as Quad, AUKUS, etc. in order to counter the rising dominance of China in the Indo-Pacific region. So when you look at the Pacific Island countries, historically, it is the Western countries which have enjoyed good relationship with the Pacific Island countries. But in the last 10 years, China has started slowly increasing its influence even in these Pacific Island countries. The best example happens to be the recent security pact which has been signed between China and Solomon Islands. So this security pact which has been signed between China and Solomon Islands has in turn posed challenge for the regional groupings such as Quad and AUKUS. Now going forward, now China is seeking for a much greater engagement with all the Pacific Island countries. So recently, the second China Pacific Island countries foreign ministers meeting was held. This particular meeting was co-hosted by China and Fiji. Now, during this particular meeting, China's foreign minister 
attempt to push forward a comprehensive deal which would involve cooperation between China and the Pacific Island countries in almost all the spheres involving the economic cooperation, political cooperation, strategic cooperation and so on. So China was pushing for a comprehensive deal with all the Pacific Island countries as a group. However, there was lack of consensus among the Pacific Island countries. So since all the members of the Pacific Island countries could not reach a conclusion that they should have a much greater engagement with China, this particular deal which China has pushed forward did not materialize. But this does not mean that this is the end of road for China. Now China has basically two options. Option number one, China can very well go back to the drawing table. It can reformulate the comprehensive deal so that it has been made acceptable to all the Pacific Island countries and later it may pitch forward for this reformulated deal with the Pacific Island countries. That is option one. Second, what China could also do is instead of engaging with all the Pacific Island countries as a group, China may start pushing for bilateral comprehensive deals with the individual countries. China has already done it with the Solomon Islands and very well China may pursue bilateral deal with the individual Pacific Island countries. So here China's greater engagement with the Pacific Island countries could have implications for India which is obviously a member of the Quad and this would also have implication for the other regional powers such as US, Australia, Japan etc which are trying to increase their presence in the Indo-Pacific region. So this is the development which this particular article has highlighted. So as far as your UPC examination is concerned, two things become quite important. One is China's engagement with the Pacific Island countries and second, what implications it has for India and for the maritime security in the Indo-Pacific region. So keeping in mind the requirement of the UPC mains examination, we will focus on different aspects such as why is China focusing on much greater engagement with the Pacific Island countries? Why China's outreach to the Pacific Island countries has faced pressure from the Pacific Island countries? What implications it could have? And what should India do to counter China in the Pacific Island countries? So when it comes to China's interest in the Pacific Island countries, broadly, it can be categorized into two types of interest. That is the economic interest and the strategic interest. Economic interest is obviously because China would want to undertake exploration of ores and minerals in the exclusive economic zones of the Pacific Island countries. So just like India, China is a country which needs huge amount of energy resources in order to fuel its economy. So one obviously is the economic interest. But more importantly, China's engagement with the Pacific Island countries is more strategic in nature. Why is that? So first and foremost, if you look at the regional powers such as Australia, Japan, USA, etc. They have formed their own regional grouping such as Quad, AUKUS in order to counter the growing influence of China. So now to counter these regional groupings, China should obviously reach out to those countries which are in its own favor. So now China believes that by forging greater partnership with the Pacific Island countries, it would be able to counter the dominance of Quad and AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific region. That's the first thing. Second, China has already claimed that the entire South China Sea belongs to itself. So now slowly China is trying to enhance its maritime influence in the Indo-Pacific region beyond the South China Sea. So once China has greater maritime influence in the Pacific Island countries, China's influence will range from the South China Sea all the way to the far seas that is until the Pacific Island countries. So over a period of time China can become a blue water navy and this is one of the ways by which China can become a kind of superpower in the Indo-Pacific region. And third and most important is China also feels that if it is able to engage with the Pacific Island countries, it will be able to woo 
the pacific island countries away from western countries such as usa also taiwan and this will in turn make the goal of taiwan's reunification much more easier for china so accordingly china has already signed the security pact with the solomon islands and during the recent second china pacific island foreign ministers meeting which was co-hosted by china and fiji china proposed for a comprehensive deal which would involve cooperation in almost all the spheres including political sphere economic sphere and the strategic aspect however this particular comprehensive deal was not finalized because the pacific island countries as a group did not come to a consensus the question is why first and foremost the some of the pacific island countries believed that if such a deal is signed it could have a adverse impact on their sovereignty so some of the pacific island countries are well aware of the debt trap diplomacy which chinese government has been following and we have seen that this debt trap diplomacy has gone against the interests of countries which have sought greater engagement with china best example happens to be sri lanka so some of the countries are well aware of the traps of greater engagement with china so accordingly they believe that such a comprehensive deal would have a adverse impact on sovereignty secondly so within the pacific island countries you may have certain countries which may be in favor of signing a comprehensive deal with china whereas some other countries may not be in a favor of signing a deal with china now if this particular comprehensive deal is signed what would possibly happen is this unity which right now exists between the pacific island countries would get adversely affected so that is why some pacific island countries do not go ahead with the comprehensive deal and third and most importantly the pacific island countries do not want to get unnecessarily dragged into the major power conflicts in the indo pacific region so some of the countries believe that if they go ahead and sign a comprehensive deal with china they will get unnecessarily dragged into the regional conflicts between us and china and hence they have decided to stay away from the comprehensive deal. now coming to the implications of the greater chinese engagement with the pacific island countries first and foremost greater engagement between china and the pacific island countries would go against the direct interest of regional powers such as australia and us which have traditionally enjoyed dominance in this part of the pacific island as far as india is concerned for india we do not have any immediate and direct concern because the pacific island countries are far away from india but we must also realize that india has forged partnership with countries such as australia us etc in order to become members of regional grouping such as quad so if chinese presence in the indo pacific region increases obviously the interest of us and australia would get affected and if the interest of our regional partners get affected then india's ambitions and interests will also get adversely affected and as far as the pacific island countries are concerned so as i stated before now china may try to pursue bilateral deal with the individual countries and if china does that it will in turn adversely affect the sovereignty and unity of the pacific island countries as a group now coming to last part that is the india and pacific island countries so traditionally the relationship between india and pacific island countries can be seen in terms of the presence of the large indian diaspora in this part of the world so basically it is the indian diaspora in the pacific island countries which has led to greater engagement between india and the pacific island countries india also participates as a dialogue partner in the pacific island forum apart from that we have also formed india and pacific islands cooperation so as to promote greater cooperation between india and the pacific island countries so going forward what should we do in order to promote greater engagement with the pacific island countries see first and foremost india as you know is pursuing blue economy that is we are focusing on optimal utilization of the marine resources so probably india could engage with the pacific island countries in order to promote blue economy so the promotion of blue economy 
would not only benefit India, but it will also promote economic growth and development in the Pacific Island countries. Secondly, the Pacific Island countries, as I stated before, are facing the growing threat of the climate change. So India could partner with these Pacific Island countries for the necessary capacity building with respect to disaster management. We could also foster cooperation in the field of healthcare, infrastructure development and so on. So these are some of the important aspects which one should know as far as this particular article is concerned. With this, let us now take up the next article. The next article appears on page number 8 in the form of an editorial. The article is titled as a critical juncture. See for the financial year 21-22, the central government was supposed to pay a GST compensation dues of more than rupees 78,000 crores to the state government. And so far there was a delay in the payment of this GST compensation dues to the state government. Now the particular article here highlights that the central government has finally decided to pay the GST compensation dues to the state government. And accordingly, the article are used for bringing about reforms in the GST regime. Particularly, the article talks about bringing about reforms with respect to the rationalization of the GST tax rates. So as far as this particular article which has appeared in today's newspaper is concerned, we must be aware about various aspects of GST compensation mechanism. Now all the aspects related to the GST compensation mechanism I have already discussed in the recent DNS dated 5th of May 2022. Since I have already covered all the aspects related to the GST compensation mechanism, I shall not go into these aspects once again. But if you look at the overall importance of GST from the perspective of prelims, it is quite high. For example, in the previous year prelims, we have seen questions appearing from the GST. For example, in prelims 2018, we had a question as to which all category of goods are exempted under the GST. And then in prelims 2017, we had a question as to what are the likely advantages of implementing the GST regime. So based upon the nature of questions asked in the previous year prelims, we shall take up certain prelims questions for practice. So here, first and foremost, we will understand about various taxes which have been subsumed under GST and which all products right now are outside the GST regime. So when you look at the GST, most of you must be knowing that GST was a major indirect tax reform introduced by the government of India. The idea behind GST was to have one nation, one tax. So as part of the GST regime, major indirect taxes have now become part of the GST. So the idea behind introduction of GST was to remove the cascading effect of tax on taxes. So as far as the prelims examination is concerned, we should be aware as to which all central taxes and state taxes have now been subsumed under the goods and service tax. So central taxes which have now become part of GST include the central excise duty which the central government imposes on the manufacture of goods, the additional excise duty, additional customs duty, central sales tax which was earlier imposed on interstate movement of goods, service tax and various surcharge and cess such as Krishi Kalyan cess, Swach Bharat cess and so on. So all of these central taxes which were imposed by the central government, they have now become part of the GST regime. When it comes to state taxes, these include the state value added tax which is imposed on sale of goods, luxury tax, purchase tax, entry tax, octroi duty, tax on advertisements, tax on lotteries and gambling and various cess and surcharge imposed by the state government. So all of these taxes have now become part of the GST regime. So based upon this particular understanding, please have a look at the practice MCQ number 5. The question here is, which among the following central taxes have now been subsumed under the GST? What do you think is the answer to this particular question? Let me know the answer in the comment section given below. 
Now coming to the products which are outside the GST. So there are some products which are right now outside the GST, which are these products. First and foremost, alcohol for human consumption is outside the GST. This is so because the power to impose tax on alcohol for human consumption, it remains with the respect to state government. So right now, the state government impose VAT or the sales tax on alcohol for the human consumption and it is not part of the GST regime. Secondly, right now we have five petroleum products which are outside the GST, which are these five petroleum products. These include crude oil, diesel, petrol, natural gas and aviation turbine fuel. So right now these five petroleum products are outside the GST. But please do remember that there are certain petroleum products which are part of the GST regime, which are these products. One is kerosene and the second one is LPG cylinders. So both kerosene as well as LPG cylinders, they are right now part of the GST regime. Apart from that, you should also understand that the GST council has been empowered to decide or recommend the date from which the GST will be applicable to these five petroleum products. So GST council can recommend as to on what date these five petroleum products would become part of GST. And once the recommendation is given by the GST, accordingly, the central government and the state government will issue their notification to bring these five petroleum products under the GST regime. Next, very interestingly, we also have the commodity here that is tobacco. Now, why it is interesting here is because on tobacco, not only we impose GST, but we also impose the additional excise duty, which is actually imposed by the central government. So tobacco is one unique product where we are imposing GST plus we are also imposing additional excise duty, which is actually imposed by the central government. And that is why it is a unique kind of product which is under the GST as well, plus under the additional excise duty imposed by the central government. Entertainment tax, which is imposed by the local bodies, is also not part of the GST. And last and most important is electricity. So the supply of electricity right now is exempted from the GST. So when discoms, that is the distribution company supply electricity to the households, the supply of such electricity is exempted from the GST. And this exemption has been given by the government through the notification. So based upon this particular understanding, please have a look at the practice MCQ number six. The question here is which among the following petroleum products are outside the ambit of GST and we have the options petrol and diesel, aviation turbine fuel, natural gas, kerosene and LPG cylinders. So let us know the answer in the comment section given below. Now coming to the important aspects of the GST Council. So GST Council is actually a constitutional body which has been set up under Article 279A of the Indian Constitution. The main mandate of the GST Council is to recommend for the GST rates on the supply of different goods and services. So please do note here that the GST Council as such does not directly fix the GST rates on goods and services. The GST Council will only recommend as to what should be the GST rate on a particular goods or particular services. So once a recommendation is given, then the central government and the state government will come up there with their own separate notification and fix the GST rates as recommended by the GST Council. For example, the GST Council may recommend that the GST rates on toothpaste may be 5%. So this is a recommendation that the GST Council gives. So once this recommendation is given, the central government will come up with its own notification where it will impose 2.5 central GST on toothpaste. The respective state government will also come up with their own notification and they will impose 2.5 state GST on toothpaste. So this is how this particular mechanism works. The GST Council will also recommend as to on what date the petroleum products can be brought under the GST. That is the five petroleum products which we recently discussed. 
the gst council will also recommend as to which all taxes surcharge and cess can become part of the gst with respect to composition the gst council it is the mechanism to promote center state cooperation so it has representation from both center and states for example the central government is represented by the union finance minister as well as union minister of state for finance the state governments are represented by the respective finance minister and more importantly please do remember that even the union territories which have the state legislative assemblies are also given representation in the gst council please do let us know in the comment section as to which all are the union territories which have the state legislative assemblies and hence have been given representation in the gst council in case if you don't know please try to find out and let us know in the comments section so totally the gst council has 33 members from the center states as well as the union territories with the state legislative assemblies next when, when it comes to the voting the central government has a voting weightage of 1/3 so 1/3 here would mean that the central government has a weight, voting weight of 33.33% so one vote of the center will carry a weightage of 33.33% all the states as well as union territories with the state legislative assemblies put together have the remaining two third voting weightage so two third voting weightage here would mean that all of them put together would have a voting weight of 66.66% further please do remember that this 66.66% voting weight of the states it is actually equally divided among all the states so all the states be it say the state of sikkim or say the state of maharashtra all the states will get equal votes so here the voting is not based upon how much revenue a particular state is contributing to gst all the states will get equal voting share and how does the gst council take decision here in order to take a decision at least 75% of the votes have to be in the favor of a particular decision now let's imagine a particular scenario where all the states put together they have 66.66% of the votes and the states are in favor of a particular decision but the central government which has a voting weight of 33.33% is not in favor of a decision so if you have to decide on a particular issue 75% of the votes have to concur or agree to a particular decision but here the example which i have gave here central government which has a voting weight of 33.33 is not in favor which means that even if all the states agree to a particular decision then the decision will not be taken because they will not be able to muster 75% of the votes so in a way the central government exercises a kind of virtual veto in the decisions of the gst council so based upon this particular understanding of the gst council please have a look at the practice mcq number 7 and practice mcq number 8 and let us know the answers in the comment section given below with this let us now take up the next article the next article appears on page number 15 the article is titled as liquid mirror telescope in devasthan sees the first light This article shall be important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection of science and technology. This article highlights that India's first and Asia's largest liquid mirror telescope has been made operational in the Nainital district of Uttarakhand. This liquid mirror telescope is located at Devasthal Observatory campus of the Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences. This particular institute is a autonomous institute under the Department of Science and Technology. The telescope has been built through an international collaboration of scientists from different countries that is Canada, Belgium and India. The basic purpose for setting up of this particular telescope is to undertake the survey of the sky and observe various space phenomena such as the distant galaxies, space debris, transient phenomena such as the supernova explosion and so on now when it comes to working mechanism of the liquid mirror telescope see in case of the normal telescopes 
what we use is a conventional mirrors so these conventional mirrors are basically used in the normal telescopes in order to capture the incoming light the light so captured is then analyzed and then we observe the various phenomena which are taking space which are taking place in the sky but when it comes to the liquid mirror telescopes in case of liquid mirror telescopes we do not use the conventional mirrors in place of conventional mirrors what we use is mercury now mercury is used because just like conventional mirror mercury is also reflective in nature so just like conventional mirror even the mercury reflects the light and that is why in case of liquid mirror telescopes we use mercury so if you look at the working mechanism of liquid mirror telescope here what we do is mercury is placed in a particular vessel as you can see here and this particular vessel is spun around so fast that the mercury which is placed in the vessel curves into a kind of parabolic shape so mercury which has been placed into a vessel the vessel is spun around so fast that the mercury turns into parabolic shape and once it turns into parabolic shape it becomes as good as a conventional mirror so just like a conventional mirror mercury can then be used to capture and focus the incoming light there are a number of advantages of the liquid mirror telescope over and above the normal telescope this is so because the liquid mirror telescopes are considered to be much more lighter and simpler in operation in comparison to the normal telescopes it takes much less time to construct the liquid mirror telescopes and even the cost of the liquid mirror telescopes is quite lower for example it has been said that the liquid mirror telescopes are one tenth the cost of the conventional mirror telescopes but at the same time there are certain problems with respect to the usage of the liquid mirror telescopes and that is why the liquid mirror telescopes cannot completely replace the normal telescopes now here the problem is when you look at the normal telescopes the normal telescopes can be turned and pointed in any direction in order to observe the sky now for example you have a normal telescope on the ground this particular normal telescope can be turned and pointed in any direction towards the sky and this can be used to observe any part of the sky but when it comes to the liquid mirror telescopes so let's say if you have a liquid mirror telescope this liquid mirror telescope cannot be turned or pointed in any direction so what happens is as the earth keeps on rotating this particular telescope will keep on observing different parts of the sky and by doing that it will be able to observe various space phenomena so this is how the liquid mirror telescope works and there are certain advantages of the liquid mirror telescope over and above the normal telescopes but it has certain problems as well and that is why the liquid mirror telescopes cannot completely replace the normal telescopes so as far as your prelims examination is concerned please do remember that india's first and asia's largest liquid mirror telescope has been made operational so this is not the world's first liquid mirror telescope rather it is india's first liquid mirror telescope so these are some important aspects which one should know as far as your examination is concerned the next article appears on page number 1 now this particular article is related to the growing insurgency in the kashmir valley so this particular article becomes important from the perspective of gs paper 3 particularly under the subsection of internal security so from the perspective of gs paper 3 that is internal security one should be aware about various aspects that is the revocation of special status of kashmir under article 370 and its impact on the internal security the measures undertaken by the government in order to handle the insurgency in kashmir and what more is required to be done so all of these aspects which are important from the perspective of the upsc examination have already been covered in the dns dated 25th of april 2022 so those of you who have not gone through this particular dns please go through this particular dns in order to understand all the aspects related to the internal security challenges in the kashmir valley with this we have come to the end of today's discussion let us now have a look at the question for the day